Chapter Nineteen of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Nineteen. Henchard and Elizabeth sat conversing by the fire. It was three weeks after Mrs. Henchard's funeral. The candles were not lighted, and a restless, acrobatic flame poised on a coal called from the shady walls the smiles of all shapes that could respond the old pier-glass with gilt columns and huge entablature, the picture-frames, sundry knobs and handles, and the brass rosette at the bottom of each ribboned bell-pole on either side of the chimney-piece. "'Elizabeth, do you think much of old times?' said Henchard. "'Yes, sir, often,' she said. "'Who do you put in your pictures of them? "'Mother and father. Nobody else, hardly.' Henchard always looked like one bent on resisting pain when Elizabeth Jane spoke of Richard Newson as father. "'Ah, I am out of all that, am I not?' he said. "'Was Newson a kind father?' "'Yes, sir, very.' Henchard's face settled into an expression of stolid loneliness which gradually modulated into something softer. "'Suppose I had been your real father,' he said. Would you have cared for me as much as you cared for Richard Newson? I can't think it, she said quickly. I can think of no other as my father except my father. Henchard's wife was dissevered from him by death. His friend and helper Farfrae by estrangement, Elizabeth Jane by ignorance. It seemed to him that only one of them could possibly be recalled, and that was the girl. His mind began vibrating between the wish to reveal himself to her and the policy of leaving well alone till he could no longer sit still. He walked up and down, and then he came and stood behind her chair, looking down upon the top of her head. He could no longer restrain his impulse. "'What did your mother tell you about me, my history?' he asked. "'That you were related by marriage.' she should have told more before you knew me then my task would not have been such a hard one elizabeth it is i who am your father and not richard newson shame alone prevented your wretched parents from owning this to you while both of them were alive the back of elizabeth's head remained still and her shoulders did not denote even the movements of breathing henchard went on I'd rather have your scorn, your fear, anything than your ignorance. Tis that I hate. Your mother and I were man and wife when we were young. What you saw was our second marriage. Your mother was too honest. We had thought each other dead, and Newson became her husband. This was the nearest approach Henchard could make to the full truth. As far as he personally was concerned, he would have screened nothing but he showed a respect for the young girl's sex and years worthy of a better man. When he had gone on to give details which a whole series of slight and unregarded incidents in her past life strangely corroborated, when, in short, she believed his story to be true, she became greatly agitated, and, turning round to the table, flung her face upon it, weeping. "'Don't cry, don't cry,' said Henchard, with vehement pathos. "'I can't bear it. I won't bear it. I am your father. Why should you cry? Am I so dreadful, so hateful to ee? Don't take against me, Elizabeth Jane,' he cried, grasping her wet hand. "'Don't take against me. Though I was a drinking man once and used your mother roughly, I'll be kinder to you than he was. I'll do anything if you will only look upon me as your father.' She tried to stand up and comfort him trustfully, but she could not. She was troubled at his presence, like the brethren at the avowal of Joseph. "'I don't want you to come to me all of a sudden,' said Henchard in jerks and moving like a great tree in a wind. "'No, Elizabeth, I don't. I'll go away and not see you till tomorrow, or when you like, and then I'll show ye papers to prove my words.' There, I am gone, and won't disturb you any more. T'was I that chose your name, my daughter. Your mother wanted it Susan. There, don't forget, t'was I gave you your name. 
he went out at the door and shut her softly in and she heard him go away into the garden but he had not done before she had moved or in any way recovered from the effect of his disclosure he reappeared one word more elizabeth he said you'll take my surname now hey your mother was against it but it will be much more pleasant to me tis legally yours you know but nobody need know that you shall take it as if by choice i'll talk to my lawyer i don't know the law of it exactly but will you do this let me put a few lines into the newspaper that such is to be your name if it is my name i must have it mustn't i she asked well well usage is everything in these matters i wonder why mother didn't wish it oh some whim of the poor souls now get a bit of paper and draw up a paragraph as i shall tell you but let's have a light i can see by the firelight she answered yes i'd rather very well she got a piece of paper and bending over the fender wrote at his dictation words which he had evidently got by heart from some advertisement or other words to the effect that she the writer hitherto known as elizabeth jane newson was going to call herself elizabeth jane henchard forthwith it was done and fastened up and directed to the office of the casterbridge chronicle now said henchard with the blaze of satisfaction that he always emitted when he had carried his point though tenderness softened it this time i'll go upstairs and hunt for some documents that will prove it all to you but i won't trouble you with them till to-morrow good night my elizabeth jane he was gone before the bewildered girl could realize what it all meant or adjust her filial sense to the new centre of gravity she was thankful that he had left her to herself for the evening and sat down over the fire here she remained in silence and wept not for her mother now but for the genial sailor richard newson to whom she seemed doing a wrong henchard in the meantime had gone upstairs papers of a domestic nature he kept in a drawer in his bedroom and this he unlocked before turning them over he leant back and indulged in reposeful thought elizabeth was his at last and she was a girl of such good sense and kind heart that she would be sure to like him he was the kind of man to whom some human object for pouring out his heart upon were it emotive or were it choleric was almost a necessity the craving of his heart for the re-establishment of this tenderest human tie had been great during his wife's lifetime and now he had submitted to its mastery without reluctance and without fear he bent over the drawer again and proceeded in his search among the other papers had been placed the contents of his wife's little desk the keys of which had been handed to him at her request here was the letter addressed to him with the restriction not to be opened till elizabeth jane's wedding day mrs henchard though more patient than her husband had been no practical hand at anything in sealing up the sheet which was folded and tucked in without an envelope in the old-fashioned way she had overlaid the junction with a large mass of wax without the requisite undertouch of the same the seal had cracked and the letter was open henchard had no reason to suppose the restriction one of serious weight and his feeling for his late wife had not been of the nature of deep respect some trifling fancy or other of poor susan's i suppose he said and without curiosity he allowed his eyes to scan the letter my dear michael for the good of all three of us i have kept one thing a secret from you till now i hope you will understand why i think you will though perhaps you may not forgive me but dear michael i have done it for the best i shall be in my grave when you read this and elizabeth jane will have a home don't curse me mike think of how i was situated i can hardly write it but here it is elizabeth jane is not your elizabeth jane 
the child who was in my arms when you sold me. No, she died three months after that, and this living one is my other husband's. I christened her by the same name we had given to the first, and she filled up the ache I felt at the other's loss. Michael, I am dying, and I might have held my tongue, but I could not. Tell her husband of this or not, as you may judge, and forgive, if you can, a woman you once deeply wronged, as she forgives you. Susan Henchard Her husband regarded the paper as if it were a window-pane through which he saw for miles. His lips twitched, and he seemed to compress his frame as if to bear better. His usual habit was not to consider whether destiny were hard upon him or not. The shape of his ideals in cases of affliction being simply a moody, I am to suffer, I perceive. This much scourging, then, it is for me. But now, through his passionate head, there stormed this thought, that the blasting disclosure was what he had deserved. His wife's extreme reluctance to have the girl's name altered from Newson to Henshard was now accounted for fully. It furnished another illustration of that honesty in dishonesty which had characterized her in other things. He remained unnerved and purposeless for near a couple of hours, till he suddenly said, Ah, I wonder if it is true. He jumped up in an impulse, kicked off his slippers, and went with a candle to the door of Elizabeth Jane's room, where he put his ear to the keyhole and listened. She was breathing profoundly. Henchard softly turned the handle, entered, and, shading the light, approached the bedside. Gradually bringing the light from behind a screening curtain, he held it in such a manner that it fell slantwise on her face without shining on her eyes he steadfastly regarded her features. They were fair, his were dark, but this was an unimportant preliminary. In sleep there come to the surface buried genealogical facts, ancestral curves, dead men's traits, which the mobility of daytime animation screens and overwhelms. In the present statuesque repose of the young girl's countenance, Richard Newson's was unmistakably reflected. He could not endure the sight of her, and hastened away. Misery taught him nothing more than defiant endurance of it. His wife was dead, and the first impulse for revenge died with the thought that she was beyond him. He looked out at the night as at a fiend. Henchard, like all his kind, was superstitious, and he could not help thinking that the concatenation of events this evening had produced was the scheme of some sinister intelligence bent on punishing him. Yet they had developed naturally. If he had not revealed his past history to Elizabeth, he would not have searched the drawer for papers and so on. The mockery was that he should have no sooner taught a girl to claim the shelter of his paternity and he discovered her to have no kinship with him. This ironical sequence of things angered him like an impish trick from a fellow creature. Like Prester John's, his table had been spread, and infernal harpies had snatched up the food. He went out of the house and moved sullenly onward down the pavement till he came to the bridge at the bottom of the high street. Here he turned in upon a by-path on the river bank skirting the northeastern limits of the town. These precincts embodied the mournful phases of Casterbridge life, as the south avenues embodied its cheerful moods. The whole way along here was sunless, even in summertime. In spring white frosts lingered here when other places were steaming with warmth, while in winter it was the seed-field of all the aches, rheumatisms, and torturing cramps of the year. The Casterbridge doctors must have pined away for want of sufficient nourishment but for the configuration of the landscape on the northeastern side. The river, slow, noiseless, and dark, the Schwarzwasser of Casterbridge, 
ran beneath a low cliff, the two together forming a defense which had rendered walls and artificial earthworks on this side unnecessary. Here were the ruins of a Franciscan priory, and a mill attached to the same, the water of which roared down a back hatch like the voice of desolation. Above the cliff and behind the river rose a pile of buildings, and in the front of the pile a square mass cut into the sky. It was like a pedestal lacking its statue. This missing feature, without which the design remained incomplete, was in truth the corpse of a man, for the square mass formed the base of the gallows, the extensive buildings at the back being the county jail. In the meadow where Henchard now walked, the mob were wont to gather whenever an execution took place, and there, to the tune of the roaring weir, they stood and watched the spectacle. The exaggeration which darkness imparted to the glooms of this region impressed Henchard more than he had expected. The lugubrious harmony of the spot with his domestic situation was too perfect for him, impatient of effects, scenes, and adumbrations. It reduced his heart-burning to melancholy, and he exclaimed, why the deuce did I come here? He went on past the cottage in which the old local hangman had lived and died, in times before that calling was monopolized all over England by a single gentleman, and climbed up by a steep back lane into the town. For the sufferings of that night, engendered by his bitter disappointment, he might well have been pitied. He was like one who had half fainted, and could neither recover nor complete the swoon. In words he could blame his wife, but not in his heart. And had he obeyed the wise directions outside her letter, this pain would have been spared him for long, possibly for ever, Elizabeth Jane seeming to show no ambition to quit her safe and secluded maiden courses for the speculative path of matrimony. The morning came after this night of unrest, and with it the necessity for a plan. He was far too self-willed to recede from a position, especially as it would involve humiliation. His daughter he had asserted her to be, and his daughter she should always think herself, no matter what hypocrisy it involved. But he was ill-prepared for the first step in this new situation. The moment he came into the breakfast-room, Elizabeth advanced with open confidence to him and took him by the arm. "'I have thought and thought all night of it,' she said frankly, "'and I see that everything must be as you say, and I am going to look upon you as the father that you are, and not to call you Mr. Henchard any more. It is so plain to me now. Indeed, father, it is.' for, of course, you would not have done half the things you have done for me, and let me have my own way so entirely, and bought me presents, if I had only been your stepdaughter. He, Mr. Newson, whom my poor mother married by such a strange mistake, Henchard was glad that he had disguised matters here, was very kind, oh, so kind, she spoke with tears in her eyes, but that is not the same thing as being one's real father after all. Now, father, breakfast is ready, she said cheerfully. Henchard bent and kissed her cheek. The moment and the act he had prefigured for weeks with a thrill of pleasure, yet it was no less than a miserable insipidity to him now that it had come. His reinstation of her mother had been chiefly for the girl's sake and the fruition of the whole scheme was such dust and ashes as this. End of chapter 19